Hello into this quiet room. <laughs> Hello everybody to let's talk about the Southering Three at Kunst Wien. Thank you everyone for coming. I'm Maria Herold, project coordinator at Kulturen in Bewegung. And together with our project partners, uh, Center for Fine Arts in Brussels, Savi Gallery in Berlin, um, and Afropean in London, Ucha Zdowski in Poland, uh, we are organizing or we are working on the project uh, This Othering Beyond Afropolitan and other labels. The project aims at bringing together of artists, representatives of cultural institutions and thinkers to question current processes of othering in the European art scene. The presentation of art and culture is connected to our cultural understanding. With this othering, we propose a concept which is not based on exclusion, but on seeing and reflecting ourselves in the so-called other, others. Let's talk about this othering. It takes, uh, takes place in four different regions in Austria to speak uh, about cultural identity and diversity in cultural institutions in each region. Uh, and within this project, we also do a mapping, uh, a mapping research. And my colleague, Donika Hunter, um, she is the leader within this, uh, re the mapping research in Austria. And she will let you know more about the mapping process. Thank you. Um, so, good evening. Welcome to the discussion. Um, so yeah, as Maria said, I'm in charge of, for the Austria chapter, I'm in charge of the research component, basically, of this project, which is called Mapping Diversity Across Cultural Institutions. Um, basically, it's made up of a research committee which spans the three partner countries, so Belgium, Germany, and Austria. And within that, Brussels basically leads the research, but actually within that, it's um, coordinated by Jonas Tinius. He's a social anthropologist based in Berlin. Um, and in a nutshell, the research spans the three partner countries in the three largest cities within those countries. And then the three partners have chosen five institutions within those cities, which span performing arts, fine arts, um, applied arts. And this ranges from theatres, um, museums, arts institutions. Um, the research itself is actually conducted in two ways. So we have qualitative methods where we approach what we call the gatekeepers of these institution. So this might be managerial positions or curat curatorial positions, curatorial, sorry, positions. Um, and we basically decide that to, to approach these people as a decision makers within these institutions. But then from that point, we do a quantitative method and we have a, a survey which has been conducted um, and basically the gatekeepers spread the survey across the organization and um, across all staff. And the final input is that we get all the um, information from the survey, we collect, collate it, and then we're working with a specialist in data visualization, and we'll use all the, the data to actually visit, visualize how mapping looks uh, in diversity across these institutions. And before um, I introduce our keynote speaker, I'd like to thank um, our cooperation partner, Kultu uh, Kunst Halle Wien, especially Katharina Baumgartner for co-organizing co this event, and our panelists, Vanessa John Müller, Susanna Futterknecht, Christoph Slagmüller, and Elisabeth Tamboe. Our moderator, Adia Trischler, and yeah, Chilo, Ari Ben. Um, Chilo is a film, photography, video, theater, and music artist. Her work conveys socio political themes and concept of home, domicile, and subjects such as fame, glamour, and capitalism. Her keynote today will be about how she was perceived in the Viennese art scene in the year 2000 and what has changed until today. I don't want to say more, and please welcome Chilo. <laughs> Thank you.
First of all, I'd like to thank Kulturen in Bewegung for inviting me here. It's such an honor. I'm really so pleased. Especially Maria Herold, thank you for inviting me um, to speak this evening. It's, I'm really so pleased. So, um, when the world comes to an end, move to Vienna because everything happens there 20 years later is the title of my Afrofuturistic play about time traveling, identity, and fear of the future. It was written in 2016 and had its world premiere at Wien Woche Festival the same year. I lifted the title, allegedly a quote made by the Austrian composer Gustav Mahler, who supposedly said, Wenn die Welt einmal untergehen sollte, ziehe ich nach Wien, denn dort passiert alles 50 Jahre später. When I first came to Vienna, it was 1999. I was on a DJ tour with stop-offs at Budapest, Bautzen, Prague and Vienna. My first impression of Vienna was that I loved it. I kicked off with a gig at Flex, having been booked by DJ Sweet Susie at her nightclub called Dub Club, and then I had time to look around. I found Vienna to be cute and quaint. A bit old-fashioned, but I liked it. It was so different to London. I had always wanted to time travel, and had sometimes tried to place myself at various points in history, such as Victorian London or the civil rights movement in America because of the blatant racial discrimination. Yes, I really wondered what that was like, despite the obvious danger of violence or even death. So my first impression of Vienna was that I had actually traveled back in time back to 1974 to be precise. I thought it was like London 1974. I loved the fact that there were rows and rows of small shops which specialized in antique jewelry, handbags or wine or whatever it may have been. I also found it intriguing that the city was so quiet and that there were so few people especially at night, even on a Saturday night. I wondered if, in fact, a curfew was in place, because quite often we'd be the only car driving over the bridge crossing the Danube, and not many lights were on in the surrounding buildings. Was everybody already tucked up in bed? It was only 10 p.m. Where were the people? It was the summer holidays, was the explanation given, and people were away. Very different to London. You would never notice a thing like that then, would you? Another stark difference was when I'd walk into a bar or a cafe. It was really like being in a Western film when a stranger walks into a saloon bar, and there's that moment when everything goes quiet, the music stops and everyone freezes and stares at the stranger. That was an interesting experience, odd though it was. I am quite retro at heart, so I loved the idea of being in 1974 in 1999. I could get a sense of what my parents went through in the 1960s and 70s in London by being here. So much so that I kept coming back and made friends with musicians and artists and the following year began studying at the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna under the wonderful Professor Franz Graf. After I had enrolled, the first time I tried to enter my class, the porters wouldn't let me go upstairs. My initial attempts to go into my studio were only successful after a phone call was made 
and a fellow student would come down and tell the porter that it was all right to let me in. Actually, people were stunned that I was there at all, students included at times. Don't get me wrong, I generally felt welcome within my wider circle of friends, and the people that I knew were friendly. But once, I was told that I was like an alien who had landed from another planet. And it did sometimes feel like being on another planet, Vienna being so different to London. But I enjoyed the difference. The cultures were in complete opposition to each other. The cultural approach to language, for instance, the supermarkets closing at 12 noon on a Saturday, which was a disaster for a DJ. Or things like the architecture was and still is really impressive. And for years, it continued to make an otherworldly impression on me. I felt like I was in another world, not just another country. But I kept having the same conversation with people, students alike, about why I actually wanted to be here. The fact that I liked it coming from London seemed insufficient a reply. I'd like to play an excerpt from the play When the World Comes to an End, Move to Vienna, because everything happens there 20 years later, to illustrate what I mean. Thanks for coming to meet me. No problem. Oops. I am interested in... Sorry. Hi. Hi. Where are you from? I'm from London. Oh, wow, London. I've been in London. The food was terrible. They gave us beans on toast for breakfast. It was disgusting. Uh, what are you doing in Vienna? I'm not sure yet, really. DJing, having a change of scenery. But why do you come here? Vienna is, is only a village. Isn't it better in London? When are you going back? This is only Vienna. Why do you come here? Vienna is small, London is big. So I was exotic for the Viennese in a positive and a negative sense at times. People, even on the contemporary art scene, couldn't get past my skin color. I felt at times that there was the good black person, one from the States or the UK, and the not good enough black person, the one who comes directly from Africa. It was a shame, but my London background opened doors that my Nigerian heritage would have kept firmly shut. I admit, I did wave my, I used to be in this express flag, every now and again. So I did find myself on occasion in fortuitous situations, but still at other times simply frustrated trying to navigate the art scene and be accepted amongst my peers, curators, and gallerists. I have been lucky, I have been fortunate. I've shown my works at the Kunstler House, thanks to curator Ursula Mia Probst, and here at the Kunsthalle, thanks to Gerald Matt, as well as smaller spaces such as So Weit die Zukunft and Galleria and Park. Overall, though, I have to say how grateful I am that institutions like Wien Woche Festival, Ege Bildenden Kunst, and not to mention Kulturen in Bewegung, exist to provide a platform for political and cultural stories that are seldom heard in mainstream galleries and art institutions. I've had some off-key experiences with my peers, though, some fellow students set up a publication and I was once asked to submit a work for it. Well, it wasn't really a real request for a submission of work, rather it was for a copy of a letter that I had hastily typed up in my poor German on my friend's computer. He discovered it and really wanted to publish it in his magazine. He found my grammar hilarious and wanted to give the readers a good laugh. 
Other times, I was approached by people who meant well, but hadn't really thought out how their artistic proposal might impact me. For example, really early on in my interplanetary Vienna adventure, I was asked to appear in a film, a student film. I'm also an actress, so why not? I went along to find out what it was about. I was told that I would just have to be topless, wearing jeans and an Afro wig, stroking a black cat saying, don't mess with my pussy. I declined. Another misguided attempt at collaboration when I was asked to take part in a performance, and as it is, again, an audio act from the play, I'd like to play it to you rather than explain it. Thanks for coming to meet me. No problem. I am interested in performance art as well as DJing, because, you know, I'm a musical theater graduate. <laughs> What's your project about? Well, I've been invited by a gallery in Vienna to do a performance for International Women's Day. That's awesome. I was thinking it would be interesting to do a project with a woman on this day. Great. What do you have in mind? I'm going to use the space in a way to make the people, the audience, think about the presence of women in art spaces. Okay. That woman should be you. Oh. <laughs> I'd like you to do a performance where you simply sit in a room. Right. The room will be dark, completely black, no light. However, the light will be programmed to go on at varying intervals. And when it goes on, they suddenly see you. Okay, and what should it mean? Uh, I mean, what should it mean for the audience? I don't know. I just know that when they see you, one minute everything is black. The next minute the lights come on and they see a black woman. But why? I mean, why me? Why a black woman? I just think it would be interesting to see the reactions. The reactions? The... What's your motivation? I don't know. I don't want to define it. Are you interested? Vienna is a graveyard. Vienna is an epic cemetery. It is a comfortable and beautiful place to pass on in. It's to die for. It is haunted and inhabited by ghosts of Vienna's past. Dead artists and architects such as Gustav Klimt, Egon Schiele, Mozart and Schubert, Otto Wagner and Adolf Luz are revived and revered so much more than the living ones. But Vienna is changing, slowly. There is a revival going on. The world has come to an end in certain parts of the planet. Take Berlin, for instance. A vast swathe of galleries have shut up shop and some have moved to Vienna, including Exile Gallery, Croy Nielsen Gallery, and Galleria Kroner. Vienna Contemporary 2018 was a great success. Its director, Christina Steinbrecher-Fand, was quoted on artnet.com as saying, in the last two years, 10 galleries have opened. Gallerists such as Sophie Tapiner are collaborating with curators of color such as Cedric Falk, as does Exile Gallery director Christian Siegmeier. Vienna is waking up step by step. The Academy of Fine Arts, for example, is doing its share to become more inclusive. It has changed dramatically since I was first there and has become a more diverse and modern place. It has caught up with the changing face of Vienna and the globe in general, thanks to its rector, Eva Blimlinger. It addresses contemporary issues to do with migration, gender, racism, and inequality in general. Once, though, when I was studying there, a fellow student came up to me and told me about some feedback she had been given by a visiting professor 
from the UK on her work. They were beautiful collages of models from different ethnicities. She was told that she should not feature black models in her work because black skin does not sell. That piece of, uh, that piece of advice is being ignored and is a barrier that is thankfully being broken down as we speak. However, if black artists continue to be snubbed, gallerists will come along from whichever planet and set up shop featuring exclusively black artists, as Marianne Ibrahim Gallery has done in Seattle, for example. They will open up and pull in the, pull in the collectors who are looking for works by black people of color. I've recently noticed on Facebook a fantastic platform called Female Photographers in Vienna. Unfortunately, I saw no black photographers represented there, nor on their Instagram account. I know their platform is not an exhaustive database of every female photographer in Vienna, and of course, black female photographers are in the minority, but it just made me think, maybe I should form my own collective of black female photographers and filmmakers in Vienna to address this imbalance. Works by black artists are in demand on a global level. For instance, African-American artist photographer Michelaine Thomas and British Oscar award-winning director photographer Steve McQueen are listed in the top 500 selling contemporary and modern artists. But there is already a space for black people of color here in Vienna and it's called Wide. It's an independent art space where black, female and queer artists and writers are represented. They write on their Facebook page Vienna is a place where the contemporary art scene usually focuses on Euro-American perspectives. Artists of color and black artists are mostly kept isolated from the contemporary art scene. On rare occasions, they are invited into these spaces, but under the specific framework of having to fulfill white desires for exotic bodies of work. We at we Day X Space aims to change these uneven power structures within the Viennese art scene by creating a self-organized art space in which black people of color artists are able to speak up and show their works in a self-determined way. Need confirmation for this demand? Look no further than curator and writer Marcel Joseph, who is now a full-time collector. She spoke to Artnet about a rehang in her home and said, well, I am doing another show in my home this year, and for the first time, it's going to be a curated collection hang. The idea is to take down all the work by white male artists and get a female artist and a genderqueer artist to each design a set of curtains behind which those works will be hung. The rest of the house will be hung with works by female artists, artists of color, and LGBTQ artists. Vienna has some exciting black artists who are simply bursting at the seams of talent. Take Pauline Marcel, for instance, who was born in the Caribbean and grew up in both Dominica and New York. Marcel's works describe the basis of a repopulated space and its displaced attributes, injecting nomadic properties of living and giving mobility, making each image an island surrounded by diverse environmental capabilities. Then there's the incredibly talented Ghanaian-born Amoako Boafo. Boafo incorporates elements from his daily life onto his canvases 
that are inspired by the interlocked, social, and political. His paintings function as an insight into his personal experiences and at the same time can be read as resistance against society's racist structures. I recently read on the Facebook wall of a photo curator at Kunsthaus Wien, Verena Kasper Eisert's post, Im Zweifel für den weißen Mann, die große Weltverschwörung. When in doubt, choose doubt, the great world conspiracy. It is an initiative that she started with others and is an open letter with a petition for signatories concerning the domination of white males in art institutions. This got me really excited for Vienna. Kunsthaus Wien are part of the organizational team for next year's photo festival Eyes On. Although Caspar Eisert was not part of the selection process, I'm curious to see how many of the photographers selected are black people of color and female. I welcome the day when race and gender are of no importance at all. When I don't have to do identity politics in my work in order to strive for equality, but to simply focus on my artistic expression. I'm looking forward to the day when Vienna is once again in pole position as a leading city in arts and sciences, as it once was when Gustav Mahler was alive. Gender, race, all immaterial. It is possible and not utopian if it learns from its past. I'm looking forward to the day when people say, when the world comes to an end, move to Vienna because everything is happening there now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chilo, for a really, really great introduction to the panel discussion. Um, I particularly think it's important to, as you did, set, de describe the context as it is as realistically as it is. It's a very difficult context we're working in, but actually to show that there is a glimpse of hope and there is positive things that are happening and spaces that are opening and discussions that are happening like today that can hopefully move us forward. So we hope that with that sort of positivity, we can also in include that in some of the discussions today. Um, so I'm going to move to the panel now and quickly introduce um, our panel moder moderator. I will read your bio because I don't want to miss anything out. Um, the panel moderator for today is Adia Trishler. Um, she is a video and creative director, video, visual consultant, and currently the official spokeswoman for the Vienna Tourism Board. Originally from New York of African-American ancestry, Vienna, um, Austria, uh, she's been based in Austria for over 10 years. Her creative work finds its foundation in science fiction, anthropology, surrealism, and theater. And she studied um, acting at NYU's Tisch, School of the Arts Art Exper Experimental Theater Wing, as well as a brief stint at London's Royal Academy of Dramatic Art. Um, she has directed numerous site-specific exhibitions, relying heavily on reaction to location and influence um, in her aesthetic. Um, her work has been shown at the Austrian Cultural Forum, and she has been represent, uh, presented her work in London, as well as Centre Pompidou in Paris. Um, she currently teaches a workshop on production and presentation at the Kunstuniversität Linz, and is currently co-curator of an un ongoing underground program called Series Black, which aims to unite and strengthen the BPOC community in Austria through art and repurposing of spaces. So, with no further introduction needed, please come to the... Hello, 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 hello. Thank you, thank you, Kulturen und Bewegung, for having me here. And before I start, I would, of course, love to invite the panelists up so I can introduce them all. So come. So before we start this discussion tonight, which I think is going to be, and hopefully will be, a very necessary and reflective and empowering talk, I should start, like I said, by introducing our panelists. 
right here, we have Vanessa Joan Muller, who is a curator, and since 2013, she's been the head of dramaturgy at Kunsthalle Wien. Prior to her work in Vienna, she was the director of the Kunstverein for the Rhineland and Westphalia in Dusseldorf, research curator of the project European Kunsthalle in Cologne, and curator at the Frankfurter Kunstverein. Next to me right now, we have Brazil-born Susanna Futeknecht, and she's an exhibition manager at the Austrian Museum of Applied Art, where she organizes exhibitions and projects in the field of applied and contemporary art and design. My other side is Christopher Slagmulde. He's been the general and artistic director of the Kunsten Festival des Arts since 2007, which is one of the most groundbreaking festivals in Europe, dedicated to the multidisciplinary and international contemporary arts. In October 2018, he received the prestigious Prix de la Critique together with the Kunsten Festival des Arts former artistic director, Free Leysen. And since 2018, he is artistic director of Festvolk in Vienna. And over here is Elizabeth Tambue, who is a multidisciplinary artist based in Vienna since 2005, and she grew up in France, where she studied art. Her productions have been presented at Wiener Festwochen, Impulse Tanz, uh, Tanzquartier Wien, Vuk, Steyrscher Erbst, and at the Donau Festival. Since 2017, she facilitates the art and project space Chateau Rouge in Meidling. So as our discussion today focuses around the topic of othering, particularly as it relates to cultural institutions and fields, what I'm going to do is I'd like to start by asking each of you how today's topic and how the discussion of othering relates particularly to your work and what you do in your job. So if I can start with you, Vanessa. Yeah, thank you for the invitation to be part of this uh, discussion, which I think is a very necessary discussion. And um, as a representative of Consalavina, I can only hope that this is a point of departure for future um, talks like this. Um, when I thought about the, the, the topic, I remembered um, a very interesting um, event we had more or less exactly one year ago. Um, that was a collaboration with uh, Melody Holiday um, from uh, Shades of Noir. And uh, she was here and conducted a workshop um, called Transcending Other, a multifaceted approach to diversity and inclusion. And uh, that for me was a uh, real like, eye opener because admittedly, um, Constana Wien does not show that many um, black artists um, not because uh, it, it's just the blind spot of our like day-to-day -day practice, and and this workshop was really like uh, very very um, um, important for us, um, because it was not just about um, working in art institutions; it was also about like the you know deficits and a very like everyday um, situation. So. Um, yeah, I had a look at our exhibition history. Uh, we had um, Adam Paddleton um, in our last group exhibition. We had uh, Benilde Hirzan, um, an artist from Angola, in one of the group shows, but that's it, unfortunately. So um, that's a real like black spot in our program, and um, I promise in the future we will perform much better. But also, I mean, the subtitle of Kunsthanne Wien is We are the City of Vienna's Institution for Contemporary Art and Discourse. So I think also on a discursive level, it's very important to talk about this issue, and that's in a way is far easier to include um, a broader variety of voices and perspectives. Thank you very much. And Sun? Um, I think people um, who are being othered um, are often excluded in the, co in the cultural field. Um, it's likely a f reflection of our society. Um, other people often have to build up their own communities, making up their own spaces uh, where they can feel comfortable or have an own um, space or not being othered. So um, I, um, I admit uh, to your opinion that um, uh, POC people, black people, pl uh, artists are excluding in this field. Yeah. And Christoph? Yeah, is it working? Oh, yeah, fantastic. Uh, yeah, first of all, uh, thanks for inviting me. I feel a bit the other tonight for many reasons, uh, but also because like, actually in this city I'm very new. I just arrived. Uh, two months ago and everything is still very new and to discover for me. As you said, I mainly actually uh, developed my career until now in a city which is very different than the one I'm, I'm working here today. 
um, also the projects you're mentioning, Künstler Festival des Arts, is from the beginning based on on a, on a kind of, um, how can I say that, the definition of identity, in, in a very plural definition of identity. And it's really related to the city of Brussels. Uh, I still don't know, I, I'm born there and I live there until now, I still don't know what does it mean to be Belgian and to be from Brussels. Um, it's a super tiny country where nobody knows exactly uh, what, what is the common history of this uh, country. The diversity of the population living in Brussels is really, I think, yeah, I, it's very difficult to compare with another city uh, and the lack of strong, I mean, you can say, of course, London, Paris, or incredible, uh, incredibly multicultural society, so the, though the British identity or the French identity is something very strong and very dominant, but in a city like Brussels, since there is also a lack of let's say, com common history to, to relate on. I think it's a city where it's quite easier to feel also part of the, um, of the, of the city and of the culture of the city while not being born or while not coming from, let's say, a family of ancestors uh, being born there. So let's say that the philosophy of the festival was from the beginning also based on this plurality of uh, identity. It was also the idea of creating an international festival, multidisciplinary festival, uh, where notion of borders were constantly also uh, questioned. And um, yeah, on, on that level, I'm really curious to see um, this institution, which is the Wiener Festfokker here in Vienna. What does it mean and can it, uh, does it have to be transformed and how can it be, uh, does it have to be transformed in the, in the coming years? Um, well, first of all, thank you for the invitation. So, and, um, yeah, my name is Elisabeth Bacon Batomboui, and um, I was born in Kinshasa. I, um, I study in France, now I'm living here, and I study uh, fine art. So I jump uh, since a few years into a more choreographic aspect, because my work was really um, 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 question, questioning a lot the position of the regardeur, or the other one. And um, so since the beginning, I'm really um, uh, focused uh, uh, on, to, uh, on the, 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 uh, the, how you say that in, le regard de l'autre, <laughs> the, the look of the other, how to perceive. So it's really a question of uh, perception in my work. And um, yes, and uh, I'm trying to include usually and um, include because I'm working with different kind of medium so I'm trying to remove the, the border between all the medium to open the space and uh, yeah my intention is somehow to uh, to have something uh, a bit weird which is in crossing different kind of uh, spaces so um, all my work it's about uh, removing border between between medium, between people, because I'm trying to really uh, uh, involve the audience into my space as a, as a performer, and uh, in the other side also. So there's uh, really uh, a question of, um, um, I, I try to really question the position of each of us, and, and I'm trying to also give um, um, to the, to the audience, a uh, more uh, active part, and to be involved uh, um, inside of my uh, in, in in my spaces. So I don't know. For all this reason, I think it's interesting also for me to be invited and to discuss about uh, uh, the other wing. <laughs> and this is my first uh, uh, job, let's say. The second one is uh, I create a new space. Uh, which I call Chateau Rouge because I was uh, in an um, artistic residence in Paris, in La Cité des Arts, creating my object, and I was buying all my stuff in Chateau Rouge. And since uh, February, 
um, in 2018, we, I did the opening, and it's a multi or pluridisciplinary space, art space, where I invited uh, uh, different artists um, uh, to present their work, but uh, also uh, uh, all the people create the space, and uh, there's different kind of events toward the music, electro music, toward the theater, and also in this space, I'm trying to uh, uh, mix the audience somehow. Each proposition uh, is in between two uh, fields or different fields in order to, uh, to have uh, different kind of people in front of me. But I'm sorry for my English. Huh? You have to swallow this. Because uh. <laughs> you sound so beautiful. <laughs> Um, it's interesting because that leads me kind of into the next part of it and the, the question actually about what othering means. And you've talked a lot about what you're doing in your space to sort of in, do the opposite of othering, which is sort of to bring people together and to have a lot of different representations, whether it's from different people and different artists. And you also, Vanessa, just talked about conversations at your institution is also happening. But I think before you, we even get to what can we do, I'm interested in what does othering actually look like? How do you each see it represented, particularly in the larger cultural institutions, so museums, in festivals? How's that represented? So now, anybody want to start? Anybody, anybody, you? <laughs> For me, it's, it's a lot about families, I would say first, that, that mm -hmm. the, you have a lot of different artistic families working next to each other in cities and, and creating circles and super specialized circles where there's no contact with each other. And that for me, uh, something I experience a lot in is not so much a form of othering related to gender or uh, color of skin or whatever, but much more also how much people tend to to stay um, inside of, of certain circle, circles where they, they feel comfortable inside of these circles, they relate to it, they, they, uh, including uh, artists and artistic families, where, which is also, also quite normal. I, I would say that you also uh, gather with some people you identify with, and it's extremely difficult sometimes just also to, to try to, uh, to create a, a something porous. You, uh, having a kind of porosity between be, between many islands, it's a uh, that's uh, how I would define for me this uh, this process. It's like many many the formation of many islands next to each other, with sometimes a lot a lot a lot of water in between, very difficult to cross. And how do you actually see this, Sana, in in the Angota, for instance, or in the Mac? I mean, I would say um, for large institutions, um, it's more likely that uh, people of color or uh, being other people are excluded. Um, so I don't have uh, um, so much experience. Um, but, uh, I mean, it's difficult to say. I have the feeling, or in my opinion, uh, they are being excluded. So when there's a person who is who is working for, like me, for uh, a bigger institution, um, I'm being othered because people thinking like, um, for example, uh, I'm, I'm not um, working in this uh, position. Because they're always thinking like, okay, she must be an artist, or she must be like, I don't know, uh, a guard, or something like that. So first of all, there are no people like me or people of color in a certain positions or in the creating or of the process, in the processing of this whole um, process. <laughs> um, well, yeah. No, it's interesting that you say that because that's also sort of part of this question as well. I mean, when we look at the larger institutions, do we? Do you feel like the practices and what we see and what we define as othering is coming down to a lot of who's been staffed within these institutions and the programming? These are the people that are creating the programs. This is sort of how this entire thing starts. I mean, yeah. We just restructured our little library at the Kunsthalle because we wanted to focus on contemporary art. That means we wanted to get rid of all the books on uh, modernism, uh, expressionism, etc., and just looking at the titles of even like recent um, exhibitions, I mean, you get 
the full picture of like othering. It's still like, you know, the exotic, the lost paradise. I can't remember all these titles. So, I mean, we all work in, I would say, a more progressive institutions. But if we look at the really big museums that do these blockbuster shows, I mean, lots of these exhibitions, they are still based on the dare of like us versus them, us versus the exotic other. And I think it still needs some, yeah, dialogue and also like, education and, and quotation marks. And I mean, I, I do not talk about uh, the uh, decolonizing of uh, collections. We had uh, Clementine de Lis at Kunsthalle uh, twice. Um, she used to be uh, the director of the former Ethnographic Museum in Frankfurt. That's now called the Museum of World Cultures. And she really tried to reinvent the museum as not based on a collection of like, you know, appropriated um, objects from others, but she wanted to collaborate with contemporary artists and really like, you know, have a completely different um, perspective on this very rich uh, uh, collection. And in the end, I mean, first she was mobbed by her staff and then she was fired by the city of Frankfurt. And in the end, she sued the city municipality and she won. But I mean, that's for me, it's a quite telling story because it also has uh, a lot to do with like institutional structures. You not only have to convince the directors or the creators, I mean, you have to create awareness amongst everybody who's working in institution and therefore I think it's absolutely necessary that more black people, people of color with their like experience work in institutions and really like in key positions. And also for me a very good example is the recent Berlin Biennale. It was created by uh, Gabin Kobo and um, she focused almost exclusively in my words of some artists like uh, who are not uh, black uh, artists but she was just like, okay, let's do it this way. And if you look at the criticism, and it was really like, you know, something where people thought like, oh, wow, how can she dare? But it was just like, you know, the other way around. I mean, if there's like, you know, a regular like biennial, you have like a few, uh, it sounds cynic, like alibi artists, which are not like, you know, the usual like, you know, uh, white uh, famous artists. But um, if you're all of a sudden like, you know, confronted with like a, very different lineup. It really like opened the uh, uh, the visitors' eyes, and I was there for for the Previon, which also liked as a gesture. They did not include the country where the artists were from on the labels, so all the curators were like, you know, but where is this artist from? As if it made any difference whether somebody is from Berlin or from Nigeria. So it was all about the work. It was just like you know, forget about what you know, just look and get curious and do your research. It's interesting because even what you're saying about this whole system that's set up obviously from the beginning of us versus them, that also goes back to a lot of what you're saying about identity politics. I mean, obviously people want to be able to identify perhaps with the work that they're seeing and with the artist that they're seeing. And I think that is a vein that runs through a lot of these institutions. But I'm, I'm interested actually in Elizabeth because you've been working in festivals here like with Impulse Tanz and all of this and what that to you looks like as an artist or what you've witnessed in terms of or if you've witnessed anything or felt anything in terms of othering when you've come up against these very white European structures. I mean, uh, my position is already uh, quite uh, transgressive, no? Because uh, I'm a woman, I'm an artist, I'm black, and I'm um, evaluate in the in the space in the world art field, which is uh, basically quite white, and um, and, uh, and I have the feeling just to be me, <laughs> it's already something which is crossing and questioning the other one. So, um, and I just have the feeling that sometimes. Uh, is question of uh, to do it in the e easier way and quickly done uh, to uh, 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 choose the artist for uh, uh, more for his uh, color of the skin, uh, more of what is represented physically, and um, because it's uh, I think it's more about this economical stuff, you know, that it's easier to sell uh, and to uh, to promote somehow. Because uh, you can say, okay, voila, I have the work of uh, a black woman. And if you have a festival which is focused on that, if you receive money from the Euro Union European, so it's, 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 uh, it's like an easier way. But the only thing is, uh, of course, we have the feeling that uh, they, they make our skin become kind of gel. 
you know, because uh, we, we, of course, have a different kind of uh, reality. And uh, we are coming uh, through our art. And uh, to be a nigger, to be black, is not our job. So it's uh, always uh, a big uh, 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 work, you know, and uh, to, to try to convince people for the system which you propose in your work, for the topic which you propose in your work, and, um, and uh, usually uh, like to be focused on the motif. I mean but, I but, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but it's happened sometimes also some exception. I was invited and this for me was like, I was just thinking, this is a start point. Maybe, maybe, maybe things will change. Because I was invited uh, uh, during the Impulse Town Festival to, uh, to work in the Momok, and there were nothing about colonialism. There were nothing about <laughs> all this topic which we like to uh, be, uh, they like to involve us, which is quite interesting. It depends how you present it. And, uh, but I was invited for the, to redefine the actionism of Viennois. And uh, it was quite interesting because I got, first of all, the best critique. <laughs> and uh, so I was just thinking, yeah, it starts. Maybe I will be, be invited uh, another time. But uh, they did, again, another uh, focus. And there, it was finished. <laughs> it was done. So I don't know if, uh, for people, sometimes, I don't know if it's the audience who react and the programmer uh, try to follow, or is it the programmer or the institution who propose something and which uh, 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 stack and freeze the idea of uh, your work through to, the, to the audience? I don't know if I'm clear. No, definitely, definitely. It's interesting because it brings in two things, once again, like the exoticization that happens within these fields. And, and you just talked about how necessary you feel like in terms of this programming advancing and advancing away from these stereotypes, it will become necessary to staff these institutions with, or to have a more diverse staff within these institutions. But I don't know, do you feel, if you, because before you said that it's, or if I understood you correctly, you said that you feel that a lot of this comes down to identity, and identity is something, obviously, that is beyond race and gender. However, these are these identities that we still hold very much to. Do you actually, do you believe that diversifying these staffs is important, or do you think it's beyond and separate from that? But it's, of course, very important what Elizabeth just said. I think we are in a, in a moment where Oh, I think there is much more representation of artists from different colors in programs since several years, but also, of course, we also feel so much how much they have to still represent, not not so much themselves and the work they are doing, but they, they of course, re represent uh, some... Yeah, they, it's not by chance that they are there. Uh, they also repair maybe also many, many years of ignorance, disinterest and disordering. And uh, now they, they, they are invited always to, to illustrate actually how much no, we are open from, from the Western society. We open ourselves to, uh, to the other. And I think that's, that's this terrible passage that we are living at the moment in many institutions. And I really, really hope and I really believe also. It's, it's, it's a bit, I don't see also any other ways. I think it's so important. It has to be like that at the moment. It annoys me a lot also sometimes just to see that, oh my God, this artist is not invited only because people estimate a lot the quality of the work, but it's also because it fits very well into some quota and some intentions. It, it annoys me a lot. On the other hand, I also understand it very well. And I think it's quite important to, uh, to go through this moment, also hopefully to go beyond it. And what is really important when I was talking about identity issues and also this lack of identity in Brussels that I actually think is very important and very uh, positive when I, lack of identity can sound a bit like strange but i see it more as a i could do a, i could do an international festival in brussels by inviting artists only from from the city in a way uh, i i'm terribly interested by artists i cannot put any more the, the, uh, where do they come from? Because, of course, in every program you put, they are from Congo, or they are from Lebanon or whatever, and the most interesting artist sometimes is well, like, pff, what is relevant to put Lebanon or to put the city where actually now they, they live since 10 years? And 
how much also I, I really believe yeah that we should go extremely beyond this this kind of very reducing way of looking at identity. Um, something that you mentioned before when we're talking particularly about having having the staff within these institutions also be people of color and, and you mentioned which obviously must happen a lot that getting people to believe that you work there and that you're not an artist because obviously brown people are artists <laughs> of course. is uh, something that you come across a lot. Do you feel as though in your role and in your institution, are you being made to feel like a spokesperson very often? Do you, do you feel like it is part of your job to also push these institutions and to sort of infect them in a way that they can also get beyond this idea of the exotic, the stereotyped? I mean, um, not at all, um, because um, um, I'm lucky that I have really um, like a world um, open-minded co-workers, and um, so they're giving me um, a space, yeah, to talk and uh, and to listen and to listen to, and um, I mean, personally, I think. Um, a person like me in an institution is always like, um, yeah, I, I am other. And of course, um, for other people, um, this is like um, maybe, how can I explain that? <laughs> Some, um, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Also vielleicht nicht ein Vorbild, not a role model, but like a person you can look at, okay, uh, there's a white, in a white society, almost white society, there's someone, okay, who, can, uh, who looks like me maybe, or um, there, it must be, for me, it's like uh, really important to make uh, um, like, um, that it's, um, that's possible to, to, to work there, it's possible to, to break maybe these old uh, hierarchical structures and to open up and make some uh, and uh, be aware that this, this is really important, yeah? That people um, of different, uh, be other people uh, living, uh, working with uh, uh, this process and working with uh, uh, the people. Um. So you see it more as a blessing than as a burden, ultimately? Of course, I see yeah. it more as a blessing, yeah. That's great. Um, coming back to these ideas of, of stereotypes once again, maybe one of the most delicate issues, particularly I, I would assume in the contemporary art world that we deal with, is how is getting away from representing these stereotypes, and that calls into question the representation of traditional art. Um, do you feel like, or whether it's traditional fine art, whether it's traditional artistic performance, do you feel like? These are these are shows, and that these are exhibitions that should still happen. Or do you think that in order to get beyond this place of exotification, this is something that we should look more towards a modern and contemporary approach to what the diaspora is creating? I'll ask you first, Vanessa. Sorry, I'm staring at you. <laughs> no, I think it's uh, it's still very necessary to show this art, to show these objects. But of course, from a contemporary point of view with all our knowledge and also it should not be done just by us so we should find like alliances we should invite other people and give them a voice also give them the power to select because um, I often have the feeling as you um, said uh, uh, that uh, um, at the moment um, it, it reminds me a bit of this like you know women's movement it's still you know it's about like we still haven't reached like 50 percent representation of female artists but it's becoming like more natural and everybody is very aware of that but now at the moment it's like this like oh yeah we need like you know a person of color we should have like a black artist and oh yeah we have this project on you know post-colonialism maybe we can invite somebody which I find very, very patronizing. So we should, we should also like invite, uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, people of color, so all, all, you know, a huge variety of people to collaborate also on like, just like contemporary um, European shows. What's their perspective on that? I think we just like, you know, need to broaden our horizon. And uh, yeah, but I think, I mean, we also can learn 
a lot. And I think museums and art institutions are learning machines. There are like, you know, enlarged uh, uh, universities, so to say. And um, we should show these uh, uh, artworks and we should also try to find out why certain artworks were exoticized in the past. I mean, we cannot just like ignore this. This is part of like Western art history. But this should be like rewritten or at least we should add some new chapters to it. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. How do you even start that, that education somehow? Because, I mean, what you said was interesting about you sometimes don't know if it is the audience or if it's the programmer and if this is somehow a feedback loop. And in showing these traditional forms and these traditional arts, is a European oh. audience actually prepared even I mean, is, is, are they prepared? They have been seeing this, they have been interacting with traditional African art for a while, but are they at a stage, are we at a stage where it is completely possible to show these traditional forms and expect an open-minded and forward-thinking universal audience? For me, I think it's, uh, people are ready. I think it's the institution and the curator who have uh, really to uh, 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 make, I mean, because things was working until now, like uh, you propose a, a kind of stereotype, people eat it uh, more easily, and uh, it's like a kind of fast food uh, pro proposition, and it's the easiest way, and you can sell it uh, quick, you know. Is but uh, and I think uh, people are really uh, are ready to see uh, something else because uh, they're quite curious. If they're coming to watch uh, and uh, to uh, uh, I mean, to watch an exhibition or to watch uh, a show uh, uh, done by uh, someone else, you know, is because they make the trip. First of all, they leave their place, they come to the, the, the other place of representation, and I guess they expect to see something which uh, uh, will uh, uh, change their mind because they're coming, for instance, for the uh, uh, art vivant, for the uh, comment? life art uh, uh, performance and. and, and um, it's like a, we, we call it like black box, but it's not a grave. You know, it's like more like a, a, a box of a, a magician. So there's some, that I, I guess people when they arrive, they will expect to be uh, uh, surprised. They'll be, you know, and we make them more and more comfort on their zone. You know, they, 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 they become, they, we create the fear somehow. And uh, they like uh, uh, hiding in their chair and now it's like uh, the trip is stopped. As soon as they're sitting, it's finished. And then the, the, the performer arrive and do the... No, I think they are really, they're, we should just change the way, you know, uh, for the programmation. For instance, just quickly, and this is a really concrete example. Um, uh, here, for instance, you have a free cur curator, you know, to who you talk about your project, and they decide if yes or not, you have your budget to, uh, uh, to show your work. And the problem is there's some theater, you know, who depend on this decision. Because if the curator doesn't give the money, the, the, the theater, even though they want to support you, they don't, they don't have the money, the finance, you know, to produce your work. So you postpone one time, two times, and at the end you become invisible. You, know, you are not anymore on the scene, so you have to find a way to uh, 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 be present all the time, you know, and it's like uh, quite tricky. So that means we have here to educate the, 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 the curator. As they give the money, as the, the theater depends on them, we have to make them understand what does it mean, the international uh, scene, and to think about the diversity. You know, because now what, what happened for me is like we, they create a kind of mono, comment, mono culture yeah. in, the, in the programmation. I guess it's because uh, they, they want to make a number, you know, because uh, we have the feeling that the dancing doesn't bring enough money. But it's, uh, it's really um, a strange thing to be now uh, inside of this economy things and not anymore watching the art proposition. I mean, I guess that's a fine line, particularly for the programmers to balance. And I guess, even Christopher, I would ask you as an artistic director, do you feel that part of your role as pedantic as it may sound is to educate your audience in a way? And therefore, if you are once again re returning to the idea of showcasing traditional forms, would you feel that it is 
also part of your role to educate the audience so that they are ready to receive this and see this? Yeah, I don't like the word, of course, educate. Yeah, it's a really hard, it's a hard word. <laughs> Which is yeah, also a bit paternalistic. It and, is completely. Uh, but of course, it's, uh, it's to, to, to create encounters, to, to make mm -hmm. encounters possible. And uh, we are really there in somewhere in the middle, actually. On one side, you have artistic creation, and on the other side, a, a, no, a potential audience. And how can we cre create this encounter is super important. Then the question of, uh, because there are a bit two things. Of course, uh, stereotypes, it's not interesting. Uh, but we all know that we, we all like to, to confirm what, to, what we know already. I mean, uh, uh, it's, it's always better to, to have things that comes to just to confirm uh, what we already, already thought before. But it does not mean that sometimes um, I hesitate to present some inter international works, for instance, for uh, for um, for a specific audience, how can I say that? Uh, it happened to me that some 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 pieces of art that I really liked, I finally did not really program it in a city like Brussels because I also thought maybe that a certain cultural frame was missing. Maybe uh, maybe I was afraid to create some misunderstanding and to reduce maybe sometimes also the 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 depth of a of a piece just just because yeah. So you cannot also just, I think, just displace everything of, of export, uh, everything. It's, uh, it should be also productive. I think to, to displace something in another context, you should also take care, I think, for me, and, and not think that you can present anything anywhere, because you can also, with a lot of good intention, create sometimes also, yeah, uh, misunderstandings. And I just cannot find examples, but maybe if you give me. <laughs> but I mean, when you say that, uh, yeah, a, a cultural frame is missing, and I and I do understand what's very patronizing about the word educate. But I, I can, in this sense, think of the word educate in a much broader sense. If you if you water down the essence of what absolute ignorance and racism is, it has to do with also some of our educational systems failing, at least in my belief. And that's very very broad kind of. Um, how do you? If you, if you want to present something and the cultural framework you believe is missing, do you then just say, okay, this is missing? No. How do you create a system and a situation where that cultural framework is no longer missing, where people can take that in? Is that, I mean, is that some place, that is some place we should get to, right? <laughs> like, hopefully, I think so. Um, let's see. I want to get to sort of the idea of self-reflection because like you said, self-identity and identity politics is a, a large part of this. And I want to know from, first of all, from a cultural standpoint, it's important to me, before we continue this discussion, how each of you identifies yourself. Like in these very base sort of ideas, like I can say about myself that I identify as a black queer woman. How would you identify yourself? I would Putting you on the spot. <laughs> I would identify, I mean, in the, in the context of this uh, talk, because I think for me it's always very important to consider the context within which you speak. In this context, I would identify myself as a very privileged white middle class female from Germany who lives in Austria for five and a half years. <laughs> um, I would identify myself as a black woman as a child from the f um, migration, first mig uh, generation of migration? Yeah. yeah, I would answer a bit the same, especially in this context. I identify myself as a white guy uh, <laughs> coming from Europe and having the chance also to work in the cultural field and having quite a privileged uh, position on that level. Um. <laughs> And I'm doing this like because I don't want to make any assumptions woman. about anybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's say, uh, yeah, <laughs> like a transgressive uh, person. Oh. I think it's, uh, yes, because I'm, yeah. But it, I'm asking this because I, I don't want to make assumptions, but I'm wondering how much of our self-identity is based upon an initial othering how much of who you think you are is based upon what you're not. And so even when you say that you consider yourself to be of privilege, well, that's looking at another situation and immediately setting up that difference. 
is it possible to get past that? Is it possible for cultural institutions to get past that? Even within the programming, can you get to a place where you say, we're going to do this, and we've created this cultural framework, like we've just said, without comparing, if we cannot do this as individuals? <laughs> I mean, I, you said it's, it's in the context that that's how you describe yourself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I talk very fast. I'm from New York, you know. <laughs> I'm saying that one of the reasons I asked this is because a lot of our self-identity has to do with comparing and saying who we are in relation to what we are not. And what's interesting is that they both talked about their privilege. Well, we can talk about privilege because we can see who is not privileged. How do we get to a place within cultural institutions to do honest programming in a completely free cultural framework that is not based upon that comparison, if we are comparing ourselves and we are creating our own self-identities based upon othering. But do you, yeah. I'm not sure if I really get this question in the way that you formulate it because I th actually, I would not aim for that. I think we live in a society that is marked by really like deep like injustice in terms of like race, class, gender. And of course, we can still have this like utopian idea that we can aim for a society without any of this. But in the current situation, and unfortunately, I'm not that sure if we will make it in the next like 20 to 50 years, this uh, situation will remain like that. For me, like identifying myself as like a privileged white middle class woman means that I am aware of my privilege. That also means that it is part of my ambition as a curator to fight against the fact that there is no class, gender, race, equality yet. But that is actually, in that sense, you've just answered it because that is the first step somehow, right? It's, it's, it's acknowledging these differences, it's acknowledging that, but we are, once again, the topic of the conversation is disothering. The topic of the conversation is how do we get these institutions to get past that? And if we say, okay, obviously that's a utopic ideal, but we're sitting here to talk about a utopic ideal somehow, I guess. Um, how, what kind of frameworks do we have to, what, what is the role then in that sense of these institutions? Is it first admitting, okay, we've been doing this, we've been a part of this practice, this is, this is what we are, this is how we've done this, and then to move forward to the next steps to hopefully maybe not in 20 or 30 years, in 50 or 100 years to be able to create this, this honest framework. How does that? Yeah, I would say the next step would be inclusion. Uh, like uh, that we, uh, we mentioned before, we have to include people uh, who are being othered. We have to build accesses and um, uh, in this whole process, we have to m make more diversity in the exhibition programs, yeah? And um, of course, um, I can understand uh, the point, but uh, I truly believe that it's possible to change something, yes. And you mentioned before, for instance, when, when you're seeing artists and you're seeing works and then we have labels and underneath it, how important is it to say where someone is from? And it's not, but at the same time, it, it's, as a, you, it's still important for us to define who we are and, and that is a form of labeling. Do we, do we believe then that maybe still labeling is important within? But in, for me, I mean, I had a feeling that to uh, have a label, kind of etiquette, mm -hmm. you know, it's uh, of course you need somehow about the work, you know, like uh, uh, when I say the work is really your, uh, 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 your artistic writing process and which is evaluate. Huh? But uh, there are certain points where you will, uh, I don't know, work on this element or this element. So it's important to refer to that. So of course you will be the artist who's doing this in this moment. But uh, uh, what I think is that uh, you can make it happen on the work, but of course not on the person. Because it's like uh, to then to enclose the person. The person is like a, 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 a diverse, and I'm still uh, fighting about this idea of a multiplicity in one, you know, that uh, you have a different kind of reality. And, uh, but 
then there's somehow a moment where you are focused on this kind of thematic, on this kind of reflection. So, of course, by doing this kind of programmation, you will invite this artist, because we know that in this moment is like that, uh, focus on porno food or I don't know what, you know, is really each person has a, 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 a focus and voila. So like a huge difference between labeling oneself and being labeled. And I think we should definitely stop label other people. But if they decide to label themselves as whatever, I think it's, it's fine because that can also be a possibility. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I guess you, you kind of just got to the point and one of the, the last things I want to say which sort of to a degree brings this together is how do we actually move forward into this deconstructing of this and, and how do we get to this point where we can deconstruct, and deconstruct the process of othering and particularly in that, what role can art play? Actually, you have a lot, or you have been saying a lot about this. What do you think that art, and particularly as you're coming and you're, you're, one of your strong backgrounds is performance and dance, what role do you think these these forms of art can play in deconstructing these ideas of other? By, um, I don't know if I get, but I think it's like for me to open the spaces, I mean, to remove somehow the border. And what I'm trying to do is really to uh, uh, somehow work on the space and uh, opening the space in order that you can cross and see the reality what's going on in the other side. So there's something about uh, uh, going in and out and uh, exchanging also a position somehow. So, uh, no, no, I think I should uh, start again and you have to No, it made start complete again. sense actually. Like, it's like <laughs> it made absolute sense to me. No, totally, in a really, really beautiful Tonica, way. Tonika, tell me. <laughs> it made so much sense. <laughs> like, it, and it's a, it, particularly the idea of physical space and, right. and what in and, and performance, like you mentioned before, the black box and what mm -hmm. that means, kind of, and that physical space of the performance and why you have that and how you can change that and through that interpretation. Yeah. Like for me, the yes, the, as I said before, it's like the, the black box for me is like a kind of magic box where we're supposed to uh, discover uh, new things, where you're supposed to be surprised. And, um, and I had a feeling sometimes we. Uh, by uh, enclosing some people, by not opening to the diversity, we transform this black box uh, to the grave, and this art vivant became kind of uh, natural mort, you know, because everything is frozen and is expectable to, and you arrive and you see, okay, it will be like that, and it's like that, because uh, um, we want to secure a bit, and I think uh, that's why I, I like uh, to present myself as a transgressive, even if it's not strong enough, because I'm trying to push somehow this kind of uh, dynamic. And, uh, and I know that uh, already some curator told me, ah, what we don't like in your work is that we have to move. You know, we have to, and, 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 and I said, but you're not forced. You know, in, in my work, you're not forced. It's not like I, I do something where you have to go there, yeah. but it's better to go there if you want to have a, another view if you have uh, to have uh, another fragment of the situation. So I, I push people to move somehow, and uh, just that, it's like transgressive, in a way that you force the other one to re-question, to redefine his position toward the other one. So it's already something, a kind of ballet, what <laughs> we are doing all together, in order to, because nothing is really fixed, there's no real center, and, uh, well, my brother told me, make some short sentence if you no, want people to follow you. Don't make short sentences. <laughs> don't. No, really? no, no, no. <laughs> like, no, don't. <laughs> like, yeah, everything you're saying is, it makes a lot of sense, actually. And it's a, a very beautiful idea of it as well, I think. What do you think, Christophe? What role can art play in this sense? But the two things, it's art and it's institutions. Huh? We were talking about in a lot of institutions. They should just be questioned all the time and, and, and renewed, be renewed all the time. That's the, uh, the only possibility. And I think that it's a process that it's also that I can observe 
little by little to in some institutions i think it should be much more it should just be this kind of transformation which is the same uh, process that art is also uh, art is there also to to make us it's a transforming experience for me definitely uh Transformation, absolutely. It's a lot of what you're also talking about, that and forcing of a transformation. Yeah. Mm. So it's a, f a forcing of like a transformation. What do you think? Um, I think I basically um, said that. Okay, can I get the question again? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Sorry, no, it's okay. Um, what role do you think that art can play in the process of disothering? Of disordering? Mm -hmm. Um, I think um, uh, Sorry, art is like um, uh, somehow it's reflects our society so um, and expresses it and so um, if we like showing some examples um, p via art uh, we can like uh, change things yeah um, maybe our in, our in our society too. So I can I truly believe that art can play a really big role um, in destruction, this ordering or in destruction, this, the, the system of the of the orderings. Yeah, it's actually it, even what you're saying. It, it sort of builds upon what you said before. You felt your role in your institution was that even showing that what you do is possible and that a brown person can be there, not as an artist, but can be in this sort of role, well then you're presenting an image that people didn't already have. And in that sense, I guess what you're saying, that's what art For example, also yeah. does. Mm -hmm. And Vanessa? Well, I mean, the, the contemporary art world is a very privileged sphere for tension and we should definitely take advantage of that and use it in order to strengthen debates on this othering and make it like more popular in a positive sense to, to also get uh, our audience to, to think about it, people who are not like, you know, people with like university background who are not familiar with these kind of discourses and you make them aware that it's something that we can only like collectively um, reflect on and work on because otherwise nothing will change. So make this like a, a common thing that and also like ask for like solidarity and, and input and yeah. Because, I mean, I, I'm not that sure of like art itself. I mean, and actually it's not the task of art to, to solve this problem. It's a very like institutional problem. It's really like a structural uh, problem. And uh, that's what, what politicians especially say quite often, like, you know, yeah, but then artists can do something and they can really like, you know, change something. It's definitely not their job. They do a terrific job, but they should also have some kind of like, you know, aesthetic freedom and just like work on their creations. It's, it's really, it's us to blame, you know, the, the creators, the programmers and the cultural politicians, etc. they should provide like, you know, more financial um, resources, but also like, you know, encourage institutions to do that and, and give them uh, more, more space for, for, for discussions and discourse. That means okay. like lack of focus or less focus on just like pure numbers of visitors, for instance. I don't know, it, I, I noticed there was something different. To, uh, I was working also in France and uh, each theater, for instance, they're trying to make, uh, I mean, it's not a kind of ideal structure. It's just uh, maybe a proposition because we are looking for solution. <laughs> and um, they are always working with some uh, a social, uh, a different, they open the space also to other institutions to collaborate, which is uh, renew somehow also the audience. Because the problem which we find here is that the people who are dancing today, they are in the audience tomorrow. And the next day, they are <laughs> jumping. So it's like uh, something completely masturbatoire where everything is turning around like that. And uh, it's, it's really difficult. It's not a bit neurotic, no? It's like, uh, and, and I found that nearly a symbol of what's going on in Europe. When you close everything like that to protect yourself because they like, huh? people like to say, I'm privileged, privileged. But you know, it's suddenly, yes, we want to keep this privilege and this uh, high position, but uh, it's like uh, just uh, killing a space, you know? And it's like that, we transform this black box, uh, magical box to the grave, you know? And, and, uh, and I think if we do already kind of renew of the audience by working with different kind of institutions, by collaborating, you know, because now it's like everybody wants to be exclusive, uh, come on, and, and, and distinctive, no, no link. 
So, and I guess uh, by changing the audience, it will create also a new, uh, uh, a new dynamic. Maybe then the programmer will feel like, okay, we need to respond to a, 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 another kind of audience. Maybe there are some people are more specific now and we have different kind of people coming, you know? And it's changing, working with a new university, working with, I don't know, uh, different kind of places. They, we, I have the feeling we want to keep so much, like you no know, town square TA people want to keep this uh, exclusivity, you know, that not to lose this uh, kind of, uh, comment, cette uh, hierarchy, cette noblesse de place, non? Comment on dit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> cette, uh, po this position, uh, um, you, you find this kind of tentative in, in some festival. But uh, uh, in a duration, in the year, for the, 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 some houses. And I think it's really important to make this kind of uh, uh, things, which will bring diversity, of course, step by step. And diversity is renewal, which is also kind of what you said as well. But, but I, I think it's interesting, sorry, to get even back to what you mentioned, Vanessa, which actually really just hit me, is that maybe it is an arts job, it isn't, but it's institutional. And all of these issues that we talk about are institutional and the programming is institutional. And then that goes into the politics and that goes into these structures that we've already created. And that is actually the place to start that process from not sort of charging the artists necessarily with that job themselves, but yeah, charging the institutions. I mean, with uh, experience that, that when I said artists should be a transforming experience, but uh, the, the role of the artist to be useless. I mean, for me, it's very <laughs> important and it's the, why it's so important in, uh, in our societies, but, but, but the art institutions have a very, very important responsibility and that should be the, the question of today, yeah, here. Everything is, co well, everything is connected, they cut my own. No. <laughs> I speak too much. <laughs> Think of your brother. <laughs> I had a feeling that everything is connected. There's a, uh, the institution, but the politics also. There's no discount. Come on. Uh, you work with the city, and the city work with, you know, and there's a, a kind of, uh, come on, um, a link like that, which you also, because uh, uh, um, it's really a fantasm to think, okay, you do your work, and it's just keeping this artistic uh, uh, part. It's, uh, and you think that something will change. Or it's like uh, uh, you also connect with the city and uh, you know, everything is like, um, I don't know. Oui, voilà. And it's a bit more complicated. Of course, we can't charge just institution or, because there's, they have their part of job, mm -hmm. but there's also the city should be uh, involved in this dynamic of revolution. Um, I wanted to open this up for questions from the audience. Thank you. I don't want to sound uh, pedantic, Vanessa, but I actually remember that in 2004, Yinka Shinovari has a very big exhibition here at the Kunsthalle. And it was a very good show where he presented and dissected the colonial and post-colonial Africa. But at that time, I already asked myself, is Vienna actually prepared for that? A couple of years after that, I was in London and uh, uh, it was presented the works for the Turner Prize. There was Kotluk Ataman together with uh, Yinka Shunibare again, where he presented, they presented his works, the post-colonial things. I came back to Vienna, I was in New York at that time, and then they said, oh, guess who won? Clegg and Gutmann. And then we said, of course they would win it. And uh, so I go back also to what Chilo said, that maybe Vienna has improved or it is improving, which I think is also improving, but um, not sounding like a prophet of doom. I, I, I wonder if it really is the case in Vienna, as, as Christoph mentioned, that there is this 
family of art or where people share together a certain paradigm in their minds. I have been very um, active with contacting very young artists, contemporary artists in Vienna students at the Academy for the last five years. And what I really observed, Chilo, is that and, and this is nothing I, I admire. Um, I love his works, you know, uh, Julian Goethe, um, uh, Rista, Daniel Rista, um, Buhach also, and I love them. I love them as academy professors, but what I have observed is that about, I could even name right now 20 names of people from Denmark and Sweden. And these are mostly students that they have taken in the last five years and more. And then in the last 2015, I somehow noticed that there was a lot of people from the Middle East admitted into the Academy of Fine Arts. And I was just thinking, is it being politically correct or is it just a condensation, uh, condensation or, or a patronizing of, of these people who are trying to express themselves? So my question is, is, is Vienna really prepared or open <laughs> or or is it really the institution like what Vanessa had said it's not it's just it's not just the institution but maybe the psychological makeup and the socio anthropological position of, of, of the Austrians I think I mean it's unfortunately it's still true that Vienna is always 20 years behind I mean, I was very happy that Anthea Hamilton just had a show at this session. And I was like, wow. And I'm, just to like, you know, not to defend myself, I was only talking about the time at Konstal when I was involved in the program, more or less. I mean, there had been, you know, other artists before, but yeah, still. I mean, do you actually, uh, his question, because you've, been in Vienna for maybe longer than some of us have. Do you feel like Vienna is ready for that type of a change? I think it's quietly waking up a little bit. <laughs> we have a question over here. Um, first of all, I think we, I mean, we did hear a lot tonight and thank you very much for all these contributions. But I think we didn't focus enough on institutions because I think what you do, I salute what you do because it's very hard and we're facing very hard times to uh, hook up our own spaces. If we think about um, um, uh, La Colonie in Paris, that just closed a month ago, and they did amazing jobs and programming, exactly about what we're talking about. When we talk about Olo Gibe's um, uh, obelisk that they had to uh, put down, when you talk about Kaspar Koenig insulting um, Jana Vilma a week ago. So actually, what we're talking about, it's tiring, it's extremely exhausting, but it's very, very, um, uh, important and I think one of the most important things is what you, uh, I think you someone said up said something about monocultures and I think it's not about what we represent in um, museums and I think I'm very sorry to tell you but if you only include two people of color this is not an offense towards you but it's very lazy because if you do some research if you just look around they're not only euro Americans and it's um, our task to look beyond the canon you know, so it's this thing about unlearning and it's not new. It's there for the last five years, 10 years, you called it, I mean, you just said it. And I think it's about the stuff. So I think the mapping project that you're about to do is very important because if we think about public institutions and not struggle, <laughs> because how do you fund a space and who do you pay? And if we think about public institutions that are paid with public money, so tax, how, how dare institutions take money from the many and not represent them. You would never have a public school and deny uh, Muslim uh, girls or people of color, you know, like being in the schools, but you just don't care to have no one, like I'm talking about hijabi wearing females, I'm talking about uh, Indian men, I'm talking about Turkish, 
Romanian, talking about Yugoslavian, I mean, you have them for, for uh, generations here. And it's not about Vienna being ready or not. I mean, the people are here. We've been here forever. It's about the programming and about the distribution of money. And we didn't talk about uh, the government at all and the di distribution of our tax money and cuts. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, first of all, I want to thank you all for a very nice program. I have uh, two questions. My first question go to, goes to, um, um, sorry, I forgot the, the name of the lady uh, from, oh, with Elizabeth. a francophone accent. Elizabeth. <laughs> oui. Ah. So, you want uh, my full name? <laughs> no problem. Alors, Elizabeth, Bakabamba, Bamana Kwamba, Mwambuyi, Tambwe. It's finished? <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, my question is, I, I heard you use the word collaboration a lot. Um, I've, I feel like sometimes it's an oxymoron trying to like elaborate more on collaboration in a system that is built on competition. So I don't know, maybe you can enlighten us a bit more about how you expect this collaboration to work in a system that, is, that thrives actually on competition. My but second question goes to, I don't know, anyone uh, from the audience. And my second question is about um, the fact that I think, like I'm, I'm, I'm thinking different to this idea that Vienna is late. Maybe, it's, maybe Vienna is just being honest. Um, yeah, maybe, you know, other places create a bubble which we all swim in, but beneath it, the racist structure is similar everywhere. Maybe Vienna is just being itself. I'm just, I'm just asking. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, um, yes. Collaboration, it's a kind of light motif <laughs> in my... Uh, I, um, my first idea also to, to, to respond to you is like to create a space. To create a space not uh, just to, uh, for me as an atelier. I did everything, uh, the parquet, I was checking in YouTube how to make it, I did it. So come please, <laughs> you are more than welcome to to propose something. And in this place, uh, uh, of course, there's something about charge because you need to pay uh, the rent, you need to uh, organize uh, uh, some events in order to pay the place. But there's also some artists who are coming who doesn't have uh, uh, support, who doesn't have money, but have interesting uh, uh, work or uh, reflection. And uh, what I'm trying to do is uh, uh, to uh, let them the space. And then when I'm doing also some events or when we are trying to uh, create some salon, they are more than welcome to participate and to... And so like that, I don't have to pay <laughs> the artist, but the artist also, it's like a kind of exchange. So, and I'm trying really to, uh, um, to meet a different kind of community of artists and uh, because it's the best way, I think, uh, to really uh, be more open. Sometimes when you are confronted with people from your field, there is a kind of protection, there is a kind of rivalité, a kind of competition. And uh, when you meet other people from other community, and suddenly uh, there's a possibility of uh, a collaboration, and it's more based on the kind of artistic world, work, and uh, trying to find a way how to present it and of course to invite people to come to see the result of the research, of the work, of the collaboration in order to get some fee. What I'm trying to say is like, I'm trying also to get independent from the, the city. Because since two years, for instance, since I opened this place, I don't receive any euro from the state. Neither for my work, neither for the space, and, uh, and uh, and uh, hopefully, I met many and different artists who came to support uh, by doing some uh, uh, activities, uh, things, and exchanging in order to raise something. So we are trying 
with different of collaboration to be more independent. But I don't know if I answer. I don't know if you understand even what I say. Yeah. I don't know if it was clear. <laughs> um, I wanted to say something, and actually I wanted to, to ask you a question because a lot of what you said, what is your name? Sorry. A lot of what you said is really interesting, and, and the fact that we hadn't talked about politics. T to be fair, I think most of us can agree that what's happening with the political situation here is a mirror of what's happening in the Western world. And that when we talk about institutions as well, institutions are also, like you said, our educational systems. Institutions go beyond cultural institutions. They go to our hospitals. They go to our politics. They go through these systems that have been happening for a very long time. And what we see now is a reinforcement or a doubling down, I believe of um, a system that has been in place for quite a while. Recently, I was just, or two weeks ago, I was just in Atlanta. And last week, I was in New Orleans. And, the, and an interesting thing about this is that these are two almost predominantly black cities. It was very interesting in that sense to see how that was reflected in artistic institutions somehow. New Orleans is 70% black. Atlanta is more than half black right now. And then you go to these institutions and that's actually really represented in what you're seeing as well. But you talk about, a question that I have for you is you're talking about, we haven't talked about the institutions, we're not talking about that. We, we, we're, you, we have these people that are here but you don't have the teachers representing them, you don't have the teachers representing the student body which is something that we've seen across the world. What do you think, where's the first place to start with that? Even if we're talking about our cultural institutions. I don't know if I understand your um, question correctly, but if you ask me about programming, I, uh, programming, I would say, who's the person in power to do the program? Because if you think about um, your program, if you would cur curate your program, your agenda is very different than from the agenda of, let's say, um, Mumok, who would have a theme. Or if you think about the um, Austrian Cultural Forum and think about their yearly theme, let's say gardening, or let's say this or that. But while we have gardening or book, <laughs> we have very pressing um, uh, topics. You know, like, uh, I mean, I'd, on the risk of <laughs> sounding pathetic, but people die. And uh, for many people, that's the, the only outlet to uh, create a space to engage with uh, things that they cannot grasp is art maybe, you know, to be pathetic. <laughs> but it's very important to um, give people spaces in order to express themselves, in, in order to understand, in order to also um, um, be in relation to it. And I think it's very important to make the institution a civic space again, not only a space of representation for whatsoever agenda is, but for the very people that ideally are part in, a, in one way or another, be it educational programs, be it open houses, be it, um, I don't know, programs that are for free, be it, uh, I don't know, Target uh, Friday, you know, or be it, so I think it's important to uh, make programming that includes the very people that, um, you want to work with, because I think a collaboration does not only work with institutions or artists or collectives, but yeah, the very people. And just to, just uh, last example, I mean, on the very other end, just two minutes from here, was an exhibition last year within the framework of the Wiener Festwochen, and down there, there was only one person that was not a person of color, which was Philippa César, and in her work, she, work, uh, she engaged with um, Guinea-Bissau, and so anyways, John Confra, Jean-Pierre Bécolo, a lot of people were invited. So it's not a matter of, oh, we're in Vienna, we're sleeping. No, it's about what are the means, what do, what do you want to talk about, and how do you want to engage with it? So I'm not sure if this really answers No, totally, thank question. you so much. No. Okay. Any other questions from anyone? 
No, I mean, I, I'm, 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 I'm totally on your side. I mean, institutions have to open up and they should also create something like a public sphere because I think there is no real public sphere in the traditional sense out there anymore. But also, I mean, it's extremely hard. Consta Levine has been trying for almost five years now to get rid of admission fees. We want to follow the British model. We want, I mean, we are, as you said, like, you know, we are financed by the city of Vienna and uh, it's in the end it's taxpayers who pay for this institution and then we're not allowed to give like free entrance to everybody. We did that for one exhibition that we were allowed because it was like pre-election so it was considered like you know a pro-Vienna social democratic support system and then of course you can look at the numbers and it's really like you know striking all of a sudden it's not only that you double the your number of visitors it's like a real diverse uh, uh, audience that's all of a sudden interest in what you do and then these people discover that you have like education programs and other things but it's sometimes also quite frustrating because for instance I don't get it what's the problem with getting rid of admission fees but the politicians say like no you're not allowed because it's like a municipal institution and then the other municipal institutions will be under attack because they still have like you know admission fees etc I mean we still try because I think it's one very important step but yeah No, we have now. No, we have. We, we have uh, uh, pay as you wish on Sunday. So every oh. Sunday it's pay as you wish, and there is no problem if you say like I don't want to pay. I mean, nobody would say anything. We, it, on the contrary, invite people not to pay. It's just like the only thing that we can do is pay as you wish because that's accepted. But we, we could also so call it like semi-free Sunday. Uh, I just wanted to know if anyone is familiar with Brian Odoji's institutional critique. Um, he talks about this very much so, elaborates um, eloquently and comprehensively regarding this topic. And as you mentioned, what's your name? Lean Han. Lean Han, okay. As you mentioned, and I was back here snapping because I <laughs> was in full agreement with what you had to say. Unfortunately, this topic of the institution, kind of we're, we're sort of kind of dancing around it at the moment. Um, and I know that that is not, or I am guessing that that is not the purpose of this particular panel discussion. However, I think it still is the underlying, um, the underlying issue here when it comes to what is causing us to have to even have this discussion in the first place, is that we aren't even acknowledging that the institutions are being controlled because unfortunately art, education has been commodified. And because it has been made so, those who are in control of monetary means can control everything else. Um, and I think it's beautiful that we are trying to reverse the power by having those individuals who are kind of in the field and working with the artists, uh, having these conversations and having this awareness, this wokeness. Um, however, I think we still have to acknowledge that the people that need to be having these conversations are not in the room right now. And that's the issue. <laughs> I mean, it's actually crazy just listening to you saying that the reason that you cannot offer, <laughs> uh, like, have a free admission is this idea that it's coming from politicians that are then saying, okay, no, then this attacks all the other municipal programs that we have. And then that's exactly what she's saying is that actually where this is all stemming from, once again, is this systematic idea of institution, an institution beyond the cultural institution, the institution that is holding up our societies within which we live, in which right now, which are facing, are on the verge of facing a major crisis, which are facing a major crisis, actually. And that's affecting so many different areas. Any other questions anywhere back there? Yeah, hi. I'm sorry I came late, so I wasn't here for most of the discussion. I came late because I was on the march, you know, the anti-Nazi march. I mean, I don't know if people know that's been going on every Thursday and it's not getting reported. I mean, if you're saying 
who controls the institutions? Well, at the moment, Nazis are controlling the institutions. <laughs> and it's not going to be the same in vain in v Vienna as it's been many years. It's going to probably change for the worse. So everything you're talking about now, I think, is only due to get worse, actually. And sometimes, I mean, I actually, the only person I met at the march today was a woman I know, an older woman, an artist, and she said to me, not meeting any artists at this march. And I, I'm, just, I'm just disappointed. I'm just fed up, actually. Sorry, I can't talk anymore. I just have to respond to this. I mean, I'm really also not at all fond of right-wing politics, but please don't call the new right-wing politicians Nazis because it just uh, isn't correct. You know, yeah, well, well, also coming from another nation with also a very problematic political history. Yeah, not all Americans are uh, fascistic, militaristic creatures, and they are really very, no, they are very problematic, but they are not Nazis. This young uh, right-wing uh, chancellor is not a Nazi. He's just a careeristic, cynical, no, we must get our terms right or else nothing will ever get better. No, political terms okay, must okay, be okay, correct. Okay, 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 okay. Hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. Political terms oh, must sorry. be correct, even the critical ones. It's Wait. not uh, the correct term. But I must also okay. say, sorry, can I finish? Yep. That we have now in this city uh, a very, very engaged and intelligent Kulturstadträtin, Veronika kaup -Hassler, and I would give her a chance to show that she can at least in a small scale uh, make some interesting changes and support her as good as we can. We can all still be disappointed in a few years, but for now we would have a chance to communicate with this city council and maybe even do uh, some, uh, engender some uh, changes to the positive. Can, can I ask a question really quickly? Can I ask one question? If you don't, uh, quotes aside, if we talk about the FPO, if you don't define them as Nazis, what would your definition of them be? It's a neo, it's partly a neo-fascist thing. It's a very complicated thing. It is, has also to do with neoliberal uh, international, uh, international um, developments that are not just European, but just as well American. They have learned a lot from right-wing self-marketing that is now an international phenomenon. It has uh, to do with a lot of recent developments. Nazi is a historical term, and it mm -hmm. is a term of a party who named themselves National but Socialists. Do you find one, so it, it, other than the, the semantics of this, Nazis or neo-fascists, do you find one of those parties more dangerous than the other? That's, oh, okay, we have to discuss this at length because on, on the one hand, uh, FPÖ is more dangerous because it's mar part of an international right-wing bloc. On the other hand, ÖVP is more dangerous because they represent a well-to-do, uh, conservative, um, seemingly harmless half of the Euro Austrian nation, but are now getting in touch with a more aggressive and anti-poor and anti a lot of minority and anti-feminist um, agenda. But they can, they, can, uh, they can cloak it as still kind of civic and kind of uh, educated and kind of uh, more connectable. So they are both in different regards more dangerous than the other. Okay. Well, there's a question of semantics. Yeah, then that's semantics, basically. Yeah, but, it, but it's also semantics. If you don't believe that one is more dangerous than the other, then... Yeah, I mean, obviously, you, it's politics, but it's semantics. It's, it's still a danger, and, and, and I think that what he was saying is that that situation that we're in, whether you call them neo-fascists, whether you call them Nazis, that situation is extremely dangerous, and that is the situation that we are in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> is that okay? Sorry. <laughs> Hi, Denise is here. Um, so, so um, this is very reminiscent of a conversation that was just had at the Welt Museum, right? Because the Welt Museum, can everyone hear me? Yeah. The Welt Museum um, basically exists as a, just kind of like a storage room of much stolen art that was stolen through colonialism. 
And recently when they reopened, they asked artists to come in and sort of like critique the institution. And, uh, and then at the closing discussion, uh, none of the change, none of the people that had any institutional power to change anything were actually at that discussion. So it was a very valuable discussion with, uh, with the artists that participated in that exhibition. And then it was effectively boycotted by anyone that had curator curatorial power. Right, but I, I think one of one of the things that's that that was interesting about seeing that whole process happen, and is something that I see here, also within this discussion, is that the only people that were able to call a thing a thing were people that were outside of the institution, people that were outside of the situation, to be able to come inside, and at great cost to themselves, um, professionally. Um, say, or, and, and in this case, politically, as in BC's case, be able to say, no, this is a thing. <laughs> it looks like a thing, it talks like a thing, it quacks like a thing, it's a thing. And I'm not gonna play this game of dressing it up and making it look like something else so that we could all feel better about ourselves and get that grant money. And that's the risk um, that I think um, artists have historically taken. And so while it is not their job, there's something about um, this inherent danger in being an artist that we've always sort of accepted as part of the job description that has somewhat of a political connotation. This willingness to completely discard propriety, civility, in order to speak truth, whether that's a truthful expression or a truthful uh, uh, reflection. But it definitely does not um, sacrifice truth on the altar of civility. So that's, that's it. Okay. There's no more questions, topics, semantics, no? <laughs> All right, then I think that's it for today. Thank you.